the rocket, a defining innovation of modern history. It signifies men's dreams of stretching the limits of possibility, defying our earthly bounds, and blasting up toward the heavens. It is an icon of progress and a symbol of war. The creator of the world's most powerful rocket lived a life with a trajectory similar to his invention, a bright, lightning-fast ascent into technological stardom, a blazing, brilliant career, and in the end, a fall to Earth. Von Braun had a, a, a real distinctive arc to his life. Very rapidly, he emerged as this uh, extremely uh, charismatic engineering manager, or someone who at the age of 25 had 400 people working for him, and at, at the age of 30, he had maybe 4,000 people working for him. He was just incredibly talented. He's the one who pushed, on the, pushed the rocket onwards as a patriotic duty, as a part of his ambition to go into space. And then he had, uh, sort of the end of the arc of his life, he had this crash. But we are the only country to launch a human out of Earth orbit. And we did it on a Warner Von Braun rocket developed in Huntsville, Alabama. And it hasn't been done since. To say Huntsville, Alabama in 1940 was sleepy would be like declaring it was hot in the summer. The watercress capital of the world had a population of just over 13,000. A few decades before, city leaders designated an area of town Lily Flag after the community's most famous resident, a Jersey cow who set the world record for butter production. Lily Flag came to represent the ambition of the town in many ways. Lily Flag was the center of parties, and Lily Flag was buried with, uh, with honors. Tenant farmers, many of whom were descendants of slaves, grew cotton in the surrounding fields of Madison County. Running water and electricity were mostly luxuries. Then came World War II. Alabamians plunged themselves into the war effort 300,000 Alabama men enlisted in the military. Over 6,000 died in battle. The war also brought a boon to the cotton state. Manufacturing jobs drew men and women out of the farm communities and into the urban centers of Mobile, Birmingham, and Huntsville. Huntsville and Redstone arsenals made various kinds of chemical munitions. There were incendiary munitions, which were flares or firebomb types. And they also worked on chemical warfare, poison gas munitions. There was always the possibility during the Second World War that uh, poison gas weapons would be used in the same way they had been used in the First World War. One of the weapons the Allies feared most was Germany's V-2 rocket, the world's first ballistic missile had already killed thousands in England and Belgium and struck fear in the hearts of Americans. I mean, it's a, it's a terror weapon. They would streak up to an altitude of about 50 miles and then it toppled over and they came screaming down and, and had the explosive at the tip of the weapon. And so most of the V2s hit London, hit Antwerp. Um, some went into Sweden. It, it wasn't a weapon that could really change the, the, the war, but it certainly was a weapon that, that terrorized uh, the, the, the cities that were hit with it. The V2's chief creator was Werner von Braun, a young man from Prussian nobility who dreamed not of war, but of space. Baron Werner Magnus Maximilian von Braun was born March 23, 1912, in a small town in eastern Prussia. His parents were loyal members of the aristocracy, and throughout von Braun's childhood, their region of eastern Europe was in nearly constant flux. He was raised, uh, you know, very conservatively in terms of politics and in, in, in assumptions about the society. Um, all of those things certainly affected his. Uh, 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 
willingness to work for the Nazi regime later on. Uh, on the other hand, he also seemed to have this inner drive towards technology, which, uh, which was an unusual choice for the son of a Prussian aristocrat. In the 1920s in, in Germany, Weimar Germany, was a time when there was a lot of enthusiasm for technology generally and for the possibilities of space flight, and it, it provides the immediate context of enthusiasm, which really sparks the imagination of the young von Braun. Specifically for von Braun, it was the discovery of the book by the German language pioneer, Hermann Ober, The Rocket in Interplanetary Space in 1923. Von Braun discovered the book as a schoolboy at the end of 1925 or the beginning of 1926 and became absolutely infatuated with the idea of space travel. Von Braun's obsession with space consumed him. Once a mediocre student who failed at math and physics, he now excelled in whatever subjects would lead him out of Earth's atmosphere. By the 1930s, he was active in an amateur rocket group in Berlin. Their progress toward a long-range liquid-fueled rocket soon caught the eye of the rising Third Reich. I mean, the German army had been restricted in a lot of ways by the Versailles Treaty that ended World War I. Specific weapons, specific sizes of armies and navies were, were specified. But new weapons, you know, the treaty couldn't, they didn't know about what the new weapons would be. And so there were, had been no particular stipulations against the development of, of rockets. So the German army, once they get wind of what von Braun and some of these other amateur rocket groups are doing in the early 30s, they realize that there is, you know, there could be some significant military potential. The handsome young von Braun's incurable enthusiasm and unadulterated charm paired well with his passion for rockets. His true genius, however, soon emerged in his ability to effectively lead people in large-scale engineering endeavors. In 1937, the Nazis presented him with a tantalizing opportunity. He was made technical director of a new research center on the northwest coast of Germany, near the cold waters of the Baltic Sea, in a town called Penamunde. Here, von Braun, still a young man in his 20s, headed a team of more than 400 workers. His task? To turn his amateur rocket technology into genuine weapons of warfare. Of course, you know, they'd been working on a shoestring, uh, and now all of a sudden all of this money and, and big facilities are, are available to them. And a World War II is still some time away, and, and von Braun, you know, to his dying day, you know, always always stressed that what he was after was rockets for the purposes of going to the moon and exploring space. Um, just so happened, you know, Nazi Germany intervened and Adolf Hitler was there and World War II happened and the work of von Braun and, the, and these other rocket uh, experts uh, became part of the Nazi war machine. It was right after that opening of Peenemünde towards the later in 37 that that uh, Nazi party uh, officials approached him and several other uh, leading members of the rocket group and said, you, 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 we'd like you to join the party. It sort of rapidly became obvious that it really wasn't a choice that they really needed to join. As the war escalated, Werner von Braun's involvement with the Nazis deepened. His infamous V-2 rocket was now ready for production at a secret underground factory in central Germany named Mittelwerk. But the German military needed manpower to produce the V-2s at a time when most German men were fighting on the front lines of the war. There was you know, a lot of foreign workers in Nazi Germany and there were also the SS concentration camps. And once concentration camp labor was brought to the Mittelwerk, it became the mainstay of the production force and the conditions were a disaster and von Braun was a direct witness to the conditions. We probably would feel better about him if we thought he was opposed to the idea of concentration camp labor, but it doesn't change the fact that he became mixed up in, in the actual criminal system, which led to the deaths of thousands of prisoners. And we should underline this. So we're not talking about a handful of people, we're talking thousands of dead. I remember I was a very young man in Germany and I was so busy with my rockets that maybe in retrospect I sometimes wonder 
whether I shouldn't have worried a little more about some of these aspects. And as I grew older, of course, and I uh, saw the ramifications, of course, also the suffering that's involved, uh, you, uh, you uh, re rethink some of these things. I just find it, you know, a really challenging issue of the human predicament, and certainly a predicament for, for men and women who work in science and technology, who have dreams that are big and they and they they want something so badly that, and but they need help they need resources they you know and 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 do they sell their soul to the devil to get it done while the precise condition of his conscience remains a mystery Werner von Braun's allegiance to his rocket remained steadfast he was fascinated by space travel, and in fact, the root of his Faustian bargain was an ambition to go to the moon, personally, to, to fly into space, to land on the moon, to be the first person to, to go to the moon. In the spring of 1945, as the Allied armies advanced further into Germany, von Braun and others from the rocket team at Penamunde gathered as much of their work as they could and retreated south, eventually ending up near the Austrian border. Now, we could very well have stayed at our former experimental station in eastern Germany and just waited for the Russian army to come in, but we elected uh, really by taking a vote uh, to move west instead and uh, get rolled over by the American army because we wanted to ultimately wind up in America given this choice. Werner von Braun was aware that his V-2 technology made him a prized pig in the world of warfare. As Allied troops approached, he carefully orchestrated his surrender to the Americans. The U.S. Army wanted to capture German experts in all kinds of high-tech areas. And so the Army had intelligence operations trying to determine where the people might be. They also had teams whose purpose was to go out and, and look for these German military experts. The leaders of the German team, von Braun and his, his brother and some others, were looking to surrender at the same time that American intelligence teams were looking for them. And there's a very pragmatic decision that we want to be captured by the Americans because in the post-war world, that's the environment that we see our, would, would see ourselves working in, and, and this is the country that would take our technology and run with it. So there was a quite explicit plan to you know, get the V2s disassembled and get as many parts as they could and get as many of their people heading in the direction that they knew the American Army was so they would be surrendering to the right side. The American military soon launched Operation Overcast, later renamed Operation Paperclip. Their objective, to bring more than 100 German rocket engineers, machinists, and their knowledge to the United States, while erasing their problematic Nazi past. There was a specific presidential order that if they had Nazi connections, that they were not to be allowed into the United States. Well. It made sense to Truman, and made us maybe made sense to a lot of other people, but in truth, if that order had been followed to the T, a lot of the very best people, very best minds, including von Braun, would never have gotten in. So what had to have, what happened under Operation Paperclip was a, there was a bleaching, really, of the records of a lot of the Germans. And this was something that the, you know, that the, uh, that American intelligence was responsible for. There was kind of a free-for-all as the United States and the Soviet Union and Britain all started grabbing up Germans and trying to see what they could use them in, in, in the occupied country or take them home. So Paperclip arose out of this whole project of using Germans. And in, in, in uh, early 46, it was converted into a longer run exploitation program. The idea that Germans would come for maybe more than a few months, perhaps comes for several years. Von Braun and a small group of the rocket team landed in the U.S. in September of 1945. He was soon meeting with his former adversaries at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., where he learned their new American home 
would be in the windswept desert of southwest Texas. Well, um, our first stop in America was in Fort Bliss, Texas. We were quartered in some uh, uh, temporary army barracks there and stayed there for about five years. They were involved in helping U.S. government learn how to launch the V-2, so they assisted the crews of General Electric and the U.S. Army in, in learning how to launch V-2s, and those V-2s were launched into the upper atmosphere and near space in various tests. Though it was a far cry from the suffering in post-war Germany, life for the men at Fort Bliss was not exactly the American dream. We lived in an army enclave there and had very little contact really with the American population. So I could not really develop a close rapport with America at the time. Now foreigners in a foreign land, there was no sign of the Germans becoming permanent citizens. But in 1947, von Braun was allowed to return to Germany under close military guard to marry his cousin Maria. They returned to Fort Bliss along with his parents and soon had their first of three children. Still, von Braun continued to dream of space. Eager to put warfare behind him, he began trying to communicate his vision to the American public by writing a novel in which he outlined a manned mission to Mars. For his novel, he developed a whole architecture of space shuttles, assembly in orbit, space station, and going to Mars, you know, so he had all of this calculated out. He plans ahead, he, he, he looks at all the different options, makes decision what is the best option, uh, and all along the master vision for von Braun is, is what we see in the end. It's to get himself in a position to be a director of a facility that's building rockets that are large enough to take humankind to the moon. And if it means building a few more military weapons along the way, all of that's being done because von Braun knows that if things push far enough, you know, that eventually these are going to be, the country's going to want space boosters. And that's, you know, that's really what he had in mind. Meanwhile, in the hills of northern Alabama, Huntsville's post-war future faced uncertainty. The U.S. military put its chemical munitions plants at Redstone and Huntsville arsenals on hold, sending most of its 4,000 workers on furlough. So these two plants became idle at the end of the war. And, and apparently this led to a significant amount of bitterness in Huntsville because there was like a wartime boom and then a crash. The Army then and the federal government provided an opportunity for a new, more modern future in, in Huntsville. And the people were, uh, the people of Huntsville were eager for, for this federal money. They went through a couple of choices and didn't get, so they ended up deciding, we'll concentrate our rocket activity at Huntsville. By the spring of 1950, the rocket team and their families had spent almost five years on the Texas desert. For the Germans, the lush hills of this little town on the banks of the Tennessee River must have felt a little closer to home. The Germans said uh, when they came to Huntsville, when they saw it for the first time, it reminded them of Bavaria, the same kind of low mountains, the same wooded terrain, uh, at least in the wintertime, a little bit of the same climate. I think the assimilation took place rather easily, not that there weren't, I mean, you know, they, the community knew this was a group of Germans coming in, and, but at the same time, the Redstone Arsenal had been there. Um, and, and so I think they're, they, they, they started to live better. The homes you know, were nicer. They, some of them moved up onto Montesano, which they had more like a hiking and more like they were back home in Germany. In 1950, however, we were all moved to Huntsville, Alabama, and there we had the first opportunity to build a house of our own. So I uh, applied and received an FHA mortgage and uh, started building my own house. And we soon became members of the community. So by that time, we really felt this was our home. It took some time, uh, several years, in fact, for Huntsville, its citizenry, to um, feel positive about this 
a team of former enemies of ours. And they did take what the uh, Germans said was a wait and see attitude on them. You know, as it was, these were, these were good Germans. These were our Germans. And they were helping to defend American freedom against communism. Along with a few hundred Germans, thousands of American engineers and workers poured into northern Alabama. Huntsville's population soon tripled, and the city's future once again looked bright. Well, when I came here in 1963, you had to go to, to the Chamber of Commerce who had the list of, of places to rent here. They were the only ones who had it. And so they would give you the place, uh, you know, tell you, all right, there's this place or that place to rent. And then you'd go running and try to get it before somebody got it ahead of you. When we first uh, found a house that was being built and we wanted to make some changes, the realtor said, uh-uh, I'm building this house. You can take it the way it is or, or, or not take it. I don't care, but that's it. We ain't making any changes. And so that's, that's pretty much what you face. It. it was a boom town. I can remember the first house that uh, Shirley and I got. It wasn't a house, it was just a, a little duplex thing. And the guy who uh, rented us the house, he said, well, it was like an October, November, and it, it got kind of chilly, cold, you know? And I said, I asked, I said, where's the heat? He said, you don't need any heat. This is, you're in the South. And they didn't have any heat in that house. <laughs> the newcomers hardly had time to settle before war once again reared its head. In June of 1950, communist troops from North Korea marched into South Korea, and the U.S. came to its defense. Just as in Germany, Werner von Braun found his talent for weapons development in high demand. Now you've got the Navy, you've got the Air Force, and you've got the Army, and you've got all three of them wanting to develop, develop their own rockets, so a lot of competing kind of and sometimes redundant programs develop. Who's going to develop what missiles and who's going to have the, the roles and missions of ballistic missile development is, is really a, an intense rivalry. The same technology that von Braun had developed for the dreaded V-2 had now evolved into the Redstone rocket, one of the foundations for the American Army's own ballistic missile program. They would be ground-based rockets that would be in Western Europe that could be pointed at the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe to, to stop them from, you know, from uh, aggression. And so the Army gets limited uh, to only building rockets, I think, with a range of 200 miles. Well, that's not, doesn't make von Braun very happy because he's interested in in bigger rockets, the ones that can get us into space. Things changed very quickly in the 50s, and that's mostly because of the Cold War and all the money thrown at rocket development for ballistic missiles and then space travel. But uh, it was also Fun Brown and Willie Lay and some others selling space travel. In 1952, Werner Von Braun got the publicity breakthrough he'd been looking for. As Americans were still fighting and dying on the battlefields of Korea, Collier's magazine published a series of articles outlining Von Braun's audacious plans for manned space travel. The brilliant illustrations by Chesley Bonestell brought Von Braun's plans to the public in dazzling color and ignited the imagination of Americans young and old. The articles placed Werner Von Braun squarely on the national scene. Now he had the ear of the public and he soon began making the case for launching a satellite into Earth's orbit. He, along with some other space advocates, managed to uh, make famous the idea that space travel was not just a ridiculous cereal box, Buck Rogers, Captain Video, you know, thing that kids loved, but could actually be real, and that we were on the verge of actually going into space. I couldn't imagine that we're, there was a real person behind those Collier's articles, and then eventually, my came here, then I realized, you know, this, this is a real deal. In April of 1955, just shy of a decade after his surrender, the United States granted full citizenship to Warner Von Braun. He became an American citizen in the mid-50s, and there was no doubt in his mind that he was an American and his team were Americans, and they were proud of it. These guys were, were Americans. They were Alabama people. They were, they were part of our team. Despite Von Braun's efforts on the public front and advocates like Generals Toftoy and Medeiros, the Navy's Vanguard rocket was granted the prime spot for launching America's first satellite. Von Braun was surprised and deeply discouraged. 
Then came yet another blow. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. I was working on the college newspaper that night. I was in the slot. We rotated positions, and the big black UPI machine went off, and all these bells started ringing in the back room, and I had never heard that before. And apparently, when that happens, you have some kind of crisis develop. And sure enough, it was Sputnik had been launched. The thing was thought to be a bomb that was in orbit that the Russians could, you know, drop on any part of the world. And it was a shock. Soon as the first Sputnik was launched, the outcry already was in the United States, you know, especially among the elites. Why did we come second? What's going on here? And after the second Sputnik was launched, just a month later with the dog Laika in November 57, then the uproar became even greater against the, the Eisenhower administration. The Eisenhower administration was accused of dropping the ball, of having failed to push a satellite program. How could these backward, you know, bunch of tractor drivers ever put a satellite into space first, etc. In the midst of the nation's dismay over Sputnik's launch, Von Braun and the Army team saw a glimmer of opportunity. They lobbied Eisenhower to fund the Army rocket as a backup to the Navy's vanguard. At long last, Von Braun was about to get his chance. Fall of 57, they said, look, if Vanguard falters, and Vanguard was behind schedule and having technical problems, we can launch a satellite too. So somewhat reluctantly, under public pressure, the Eisenhower administration decided to allow the Army to do its backup program. In December, the Vanguard rocket attempted its launch. It was broadcast nationwide on live television. It rose a few inches and fell back and blew up on the pad and was an embarrassment on national TV. So now we had this sequence of events. Sputnik 1, early October, early November Sputnik 2, Early, early December, a humiliating Vanguard failure. Vanguard's spectacular failure opened the door for the Redstone team. Werner von Braun and the Army answered with the successful launch of Explorer 1. Rocket pressurized missile power. Ignition, base tank, lift off. launched on the night of January 31, 1958. Suddenly, von Braun was not only a famous man, but also increasingly a national hero. The space race had begun, and Werner von Braun was leading the charge against the Soviets. I'm convinced that the Russian concept, that's as demonstrated by Sputnik number two carrying this animal, the uh, consider the control of space around the Earth very much like, uh, shall we say, the great maritime powers considered the control of the seas in the 16th to the 18th century. And uh, they say, if we want to control this planet, we have to control the space around it. In the summer of 1958, with Congress's urging, President Eisenhower relented his hardline budgetary restraints and signed the National Aeronautics and Space Act. With it, NASA was born an agency dedicated to the peaceful and scientific exploration of space. By 1960, the German team had officially transferred to the new civilian space agency. For the first time in his career, Werner von Braun stopped making weapons and was finally able to turn his full attention to space. We start, we start off with a small missile team, but it grew into you know, several thousand in the 50s, and by 19... 58-1960 time frame, 4,000 of those engineers led by Von Braun transferred to the new space agency called NASA. Eisenhower selected the, the smart people that had knowledge at that time of rockets, missiles, and, and satellites and put them into one agency and said, you are in charge of the peaceful exploration of outer space. And that's why guys like me enjoyed working in that field because we could talk about what we were doing. And Von Braun, for the first time in his career, he could talk about what he, he was doing and his plans and his dreams for the future. In the spring of 1961, the Cold War was heating up. On April 12th, 
Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human to enter Earth's orbit. Less than a month later, NASA launched Alan Shepard into space on a Redstone rocket. His suborbital flight was less spectacular than the Russians. On May 26, President Kennedy addressed Congress. He urgently presented a plan to combat the looming threat of communism. In his final point, he declared his intent to send an American to the moon by the end of the decade. Kennedy said, what can we do to beat the Russians in space? He sent a letter out to 10 people, top uh, scientists in the country, Secretary of Defense, and Von Braun. Von Braun wrote back, we can't beat them in Earth orbit, but we can beat them to the moon. And that letter initiated Kennedy's commitment, we are going to go to the moon and we're going to kick the Russians' butt in space. And he, he made that famous speech at, at uh, Rice University. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Kennedy's decision to announce uh, that the country was going to go to the moon, land men, and get back safely in a decade's time was, was really stunning news. In terms of, of really designing the systems to do it, you know, they hadn't started. So a lot of things have to get organized really, really fast. Huntsville, Alabama had a serious mission. We had a passion about flying men to the moon and kicking the Russians' butt. The NASA team at Huntsville was in full swing. In the newly built Marshall Space Flight Center, thousands of young engineers, scientists, and machinists would contribute countless hours to what Kennedy called one of the greatest adventures of all time. Von Braun was finally in his ideal element. Though he was famed in the public eye for his scientific mind, his management and leadership skills would prove to be his greatest strength. Werner von Braun was a incredible technological manager. In practically any area you would want a technical manager to be strong, he was strong. He could talk to politicians and help them understand rather arcane space equipment. Not only was he good at public outreach, von Braun was great at running a installation like the Marshall Space Flight Center. He could get all those diverse professional people to come to an accommodation. He could get them to speak the same language. You had a lot of blue collar welders and electricians who worked on these vehicles. And he could just walk around and get these people to feel a part of the program and work hard. It's easy to lose track of his proficiency at all levels of management because his persona was so big. He's this Disney star, he's the exotic German uh, mad scientist, but he was a very skillful technological manager. I think he was very much the maestro of his team. And it meant that he had to know every part and how it played and every instrument and how it played and how they played together. But it also meant the symphony can't play unless it's got funding and it needs to have a, a symphonic hall and it needs to have public relations to have an audience. And, you know, Von Braun had all of, all of that. He seldom lost a member of the team to industry. And I can assure you, these guys could have been made, making big money in the 60s working for private companies versus what they were doing, earning from the government. Well, they knew if they wanted to work in an exciting field, they had need to stay with Von Braun's team. As he took on the monumental task of getting a man to the moon, Von Braun never forgot his audience. Ever charming and eloquent, he played consistently to the national media and the political powers in Washington. First time we had a, sta a static firing for a bunch of VIPs, everybody was in the blockhouse. And we said, well, sir, they, they didn't feel it. They were in the blockhouse where everybody else was, and they, they didn't experience it. 
Bob Brown looked at it and says, put them on the roof the next time. When that thing lit off, the, the noise was just horrific. Horrific, man, it made a tremendous noise. The exhaust gas came flying out of that trench and it created such a suction that sucked up the road that was on the other end of the trench. And just, we saw, I saw the asphalt just go flying. And from that point on, yeah, that, that for you, I'd say a, a defining moment for me was, hey, this is what I want to get in, I want to do, this is it. And it didn't take long for Kennedy to show up in Huntsville, Alabama. That was huge in our day, 61, 62. That president was so impressed with that static firing of that Saturn rocket that day. He came back and, and grabbed Von Brown's hand and said, that's the most impressive machine I've ever seen. He was really moved by that. And Von Brown was, was by far the star of the show that day. Once again, the local economy in Huntsville flourished, as did the local culture. Among the expanding shops and businesses came a symphony, ballet, and a new worldly sophistication. There was not a uh, Lutheran church in town, so they um, physically helped build a Lutheran church here. There was no uh, planetarium, as one would imagine, here, so they physically, as well as getting some subcontractors in, built uh, a planetarium and uh, astronomical uh, observatory uh, on Montesano. But Huntsville still faced a major obstacle to progress, the racist discrimination and segregation of the Jim Crow South. You had African Americans who had struggled for equality their entire lives, struggled for acceptance, struggled for access to good schools, struggled to get good jobs. And here you had uh, foreign immigrants who came in with great jobs and immediately were making connections. The city and the state began building new schools for their kids. And so from the perspective of African Americans, this was not altogether a, uh, a, a positive story. It revealed fractures and problems in, in Huntsville. To Von Braun's credit, although he did not initiate his efforts to promote civil rights in the South, he did not dawdle either. And once he took on the job, he, uh, he was a powerful force in helping to integrate Huntsville. But I think what really motivated him, as it always was, I think it was the pragmatic side of him. I mean, he knew, he knew what NASA leadership wanted wanted done. He knew what, you know, what President Kennedy and then what President Johnson wanted done. Uh, he knew what kind of a state Alabama needed to be to move into a, a brighter future and it wasn't going to be one where you're going to have segregated facilities and bus boycotts and little children being killed in the streets and I mean that wasn't the state that Von Braun wanted to live in and he he knew that wasn't a good future. Named for the Greek god of the sun, Apollo was the only manned space program to ever reach beyond Earth's lower orbit. It was powered by Werner von Braun's massive Saturn series of rockets. It came off the pad at the Cape very slowly. You, just, you wanted to help it go, go, go. Uh, but it was a, a monster rocket. Uh, you know, compared to the Redstone, it was a monster. But it, it successfully uh, flew a, a couple times unmanned. And then the decision was made, what they called the all-up concept, which was uh, meaning all systems were hot and you put a crew on top. The first manned test of the Saturn 1B ended in tragedy. A fire in Apollo 1's command module killed astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. That brought NASA to its knees. And many of us 
in the program thought it was over. We thought it would be terminated, we would go off and do something else, and we would never get to the moon. But Von Braun and a number of other key people in the agency came together and said, look, we can fix this and we can continue to fly, and we did. After successful testing of the 34-story Saturn V, the largest and most powerful rocket ever built, NASA launched Apollo 8. It narrowly beat the Soviets, putting the program back on track, and made history by propelling Jim Lovell, Frank Borman, and William Anders on mankind's first ever trip around the moon. As President Kennedy's deadline approached, both the U.S. and the Soviet Union appeared to have a moon landing in sight. We had three news releases prepared in those days. One, all three astronauts returned safely. Second release, one astronaut returned safely, two are stranded on the moon. Third release, no astronaut returns, all stranded either on the moon or in lunar orbit. And those news releases were prepared and briefed all the way to the White House. And, and, and Von Braun would remind us of that that you really don't feel comfortable until splashdown. On July 16, 1969, the Huntsville team's Saturn V rocket launched Apollo 11, bound for the moon. Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. It was huge celebrations uh, all, over, all over the city. Uh, I think uh, it was the event that all of us uh, looked upon as, as being a culmination of eight years of working hard every day. The moon landing was an astounding success, watched live by 500 million people on grainy black and white TV sets. For a moment, earthly concerns fell away, and the world watched breathless as Neil Armstrong touched the surface of the moon. The giant leap for mankind was a proud moment for Huntsville, and the culmination of a decade's work for the rocket team members. And as the remaining years would show, it marked the peak of the arc for Werner von Braun. It's hard to uh, capture it again if, uh, if you had it, uh, unless you do something very spectacular. Three weeks after Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, he proposed to the space task group that we go to Mars. But that was not approved, and consequently we went off and did, did the space shuttle, and we still have not been out of Earth orbit since 1972. Werner von Braun saw the moon landing as the beginning of his grand vision of space, one that included him personally making the journey. And he had it figured out. When the shuttle became operational, he was going to fly the shuttle as a scientist. So there's no question about it. That's, that's the one thing that von Braun did not achieve in his lifetime, was flying space. NASA found the moon landing hard to top in the eyes of the American public. TV networks declined to televise subsequent Apollo launches. As public attention waned, 
so did the government's promise of funding. Apollo 11, there must have been a million people at the Cape. Had to be at least a million. Apollo 12's next mission probably dropped down to 300,000. You could literally drive out to the press site that morning almost without any problem. It just changed almost overnight the interest that the public had in the space program. Another part of it is uh, a lot of people say, oh, we've gone to the moon, that's it, we don't need to do that. We, we, there wasn't, the streets of the moon were not paved with gold, why do we need to go again? We're not doing anything. But, you know, we're explorers. The idea of going to Mars, to, to land on Mars with a person, that to me, that, that would be a what, a, what a fantastic thing that would be. But a lot of people don't feel that way. Oh, we got problems here on Earth, you know. In 1970, after 20 years in Huntsville, Werner von Braun was transferred to NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. The city bade him an emotional farewell. We all realize that the first lunar landing will be a hard act to follow. There's only one moon, and I'm afraid we can't offer many more spectaculars like that in the years to come. The interest and the attention of the space program will now be turned to put all that new capability to use for Earth-related applications, for the benefit of man, for the benefit of the taxpayer and his less favorite brother in underdeveloped and hungry countries. That is what I will pay my attention to in the years to come in Washington. I think um, a number of us were uh, were upset that uh, that NASA headquarters pulled him out of here. It became obvious to even us grunts that uh, NASA headquarters' idea was that they wanted to dissolve the German leadership of that. It was a sad day. Uh, it's no no other way to describe it. It was a sad day for the community. Uh, he had he had been so such an important part of Huntsville's growth. And you know, that's why they named the Civic Center after him and all the uh, many other things that were done have been done since. It was, a, it was a huge loss for the community. Von Braun soon grew frustrated with the bureaucracies of Washington and found his ideas at odds with an increasingly defunded NASA. I don't think Von Braun was disillusioned with NASA as such, but he was disillusioned by the, lock, the public's turning on a dime and becoming uninterested in, in big space programs as soon as Apollo was over. This was a bitter pill for him and all the space advocates to, to swallow in the 70s because they had always predicated their belief that if we start going, we just inevitably must go on and we will continue to have a giant program and continue to go all the way to Mars and so forth. In 1972, Von Braun entered the corporate world that had long courted him. At Fairchild Industries, he helped develop satellite and aerospace technologies. A little over a year later, Von Braun learned he had cancer. Despite his declining health, he continued advocating for manned exploration of space. When we think of what has sprung out of these early beginnings, it is downright amazing. We not only flew Americans to the moon, we also established quite a number of satellites that benefit mankind in a very direct way. One of the most exciting of them probably is the Large Space Telescope, a telescope that will enable astronomers to look about 10 times as deeply into space as the big telescope on Mount Palomar. Some people have said we can look so deep into space with that space telescope in orbit that we may be able to see the hand of the maker. Dr. Werner von Braun died June 16, 1977, at the age of 65. His simple headstone lists beneath his name Psalms 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. He's, he's a complicated person, and that's what makes him fascinating, I think. His, his legacy is not simple. 
On the one hand, he's, he is a technologically, scientifically really important person. On the other hand, you just can't forget about the compromises that he made in the Third Reich. There's a fascinating story that it's uh, a story with black and white and some pointy hard things that you have to have to deal with both as a, a student of the past and as a citizen in, in a technological republic. It's hard to believe the huge influence that he had on the program on the thing and in inspiring people not so much that he necessarily designed anything but he inspired the people in his design. I mean again that's why it's important to consider to see him as the maestro. The maestro has he doesn't play the instrument he's just doing all of the orchestration but to do it well he's got to understand how all of this works and how people have to work together and I think that's why people in Huntsville have such a love and admiration for him because they saw him in this, maestro, in this maestro role. Werner von Braun's impact persists in the U.S. space program today. From the International Space Station to NASA's new space launch system, the ideas, techniques, and technology that he and his team developed decades ago continue to shape the way we explore space. Among his monumental legacies, von Braun left his mark on Huntsville as well. The U.S. Space and Rocket Center continues to thrive as a public museum and stands as a perpetual reminder of Von Braun's grand vision. And through programs like Space Camp, Von Braun's work continues to inspire America's youth. He liked to talk about the next generation. He loved to communicate with young people, and he felt it was important for the country to nurture that next generation who might become the innovators, uh, the problem solvers, and the creators of, of new equipment and new technology. Of all the government programs that we've ever had, I don't think any, any program has ever motivated young people more than NASA has. Uh, and I think the human spaceflight aspect of NASA has been at the top of that. NASA you know, is the best agency to stimulate that in, in uh, our young people, and I just hate to see that aspect of government go away. The country needs a technology program of some kind that gives those innovators, those young men and women who have that skill, are looking for a place to apply it. And that's what the space program was all about. You had 400,000 men and women that were connected to a mission that enabled them to develop their, their particular technology that enabled us to get to the moon, but the spinoff of that technology into the, the other parts of our country, other industries, was amazing. The expertise that's there in terms of PhDs and people with engineering degrees and, and so forth, that that's, that's uh, I mean, I think that makes Huntsville a prime location for, uh, for whatever aerospace development is going to take place, Huntsville's going to be part of it. Uh, we still have the strongest collection of uh, rocket people in the, in the world, in this, in this town, in the city. When you, when you marry the contractors, the private sector, and the government people together, you've got a strong capability right here. My friends, there was dancing here in the streets of Huntsville when our first satellite orbited the Earth. And there was dancing again when the first Americans landed on the moon. I'd like to ask you, don't hang up your dancing slippers.